Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is the 1939 Cleveland Indians AL MLB baseball season. Again, the tribe was playing in the American League, the junior circuit of Major League Baseball. And uh, home games during the week were generally played at League Park. And then on weekends, and uh, especially Sundays and holidays, home games were played at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. The tribe had a strong year in 1939. They finished in third place with a record of 87 and 67. 20 games over 500. Very good. Winning percentage of 565, 20 and a half games out of first. The first place team was the New York Yankees, who were 106 and 45. Winning percentage of 702. Holy cow. Second place team, the Boston Red Sox, 89 and 62, 17 games out of first. So the Yankees really ran away with the pennant. Third place, the Cleveland Indians, 87 and 67. Fourth place, the Chicago White Sox, 85 and 69. Fifth place, the Detroit Tigers, 81 and 73. Sixth place, the Washington Senators, 65 and 87. Seventh place, the Philadelphia Athletics, 55 and 97. And in eighth and last place, the St. Louis Browns, who were 43 and 111, winning percentage of 279. Gosh, 64 and a half games out of first place. I finished recently. I finished reading a fine book called Havana Heat by Daryl Brock, 2000. It's a uh, it's a historical fictional novel about Luther Dummy Taylor, yeah, going back to 1911. This uh, baseball player who traveled to Cuba with John McGraw and the New York Giants, trying to revive his career, uh, playing playing uh, playing in exhibition games and. Uh, and uh, Luther Taylor, back he was he was deaf. They used to call the deaf players dummy. He played for the Cleveland Broncos in 1902. It's not particularly relevant to this topic, but an outstanding book. 1939, Lou, the with the tribe, Lou Boudreau and Ray Mack be, began became the keystone combination. In other words, the shortstop, second baseman, uh, which became long long term and did a really good job. That that started in the second half of the season. And also in 1939, night baseball arrived in Cleveland. On June 7th, at Cleveland Municipal Stadium, the Tribe and the, the, tribe and the Detroit Tigers battled, and Bob Feller pitched and won that game 5 to nothing. He threw a one-hitter, the third one-hitter of his career. The only hit was uh, by Earl Averill, the former t- tremendous star, now playing for Detroit. And there was a nice crowd, a real nice crowd of 55,305 fans for the first night game in Cleveland, in Cleveland baseball history. The U.S. Post Office in 1939 issued a three-cent commemorative stamp honoring the 100th anniversary of baseball, uh, supposedly going back to 1839 in Cooperstown, New York, and at Abner Doubleday's legendary begin, beginning of baseball, which now historians don't believe in. On May 2nd, 1939, Lou Gehrig's streak of 2,130 consecutive games played in a row ended. Gehrig was sick with amyotrophic trophic lateral sclerosis, which was later named Lou Gehrig's disease. And Gehrig, Gehrig never, play, never played another game. He played three innings of an ex- exhibition game, uh, although he stayed with the team for the end of the year. And Gehrig died June 2nd, 1941. Very, very tragic. His record was broken by Cal Ripken Jr. 56 years later, who extended the streak to 2,632 games. Incredible. Little League Baseball was founded in 1939 by Carl Stoltz in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And the American League approved night baseball for seven games for each team. It was still the, they were still limiting it. The first Tribe night game overall was played on May 16, 1939 in Scheib Park, uh, against the Philadelphia Athletics, uh, and the A's won that game 8-3. to On August 7th, they, there was, was the debut, debut of the Tribe double play combination, Lou Boudreau and, and Ray Mack. And at that game, <coughs> heavyweight boxing contender two-ton Tony Galento appeared. And he had previously fought, fought Joe Lewis in a title fight. And before the game, he clowned in a Tribe uniform. By, 19, 19, by 1939, all MLB games were broadcast on the radio. Before, there had been, there had been resistance. 
And MLB income from radio was 7.3% of all MLB radio. On June 12, 1939, the Baseball Hall of Fame opened in Cooperstown, New York. And some of the induct the uh, the inductees who, who came for that included Babe Ruth, Honus Wagner, Tris Speaker, Napoleon Lajue, Walter Johnson, Grover Cleveland Alexander, George Sisler, Cy Young, Eddie Collins, uh, and Connie Mack. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Ty, Ty Cobb was late and didn't, didn't make it for the, uh, the famous photograph. But we had some famous guys who played for Cleveland, including Tris Speaker Napoleon Lajue, Cy Young, and Walter Johnson. In March of 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Czechoslovakia. It took that country. In September 1, Germany invaded Poland, what was later called, a, called the Blitzkrieg, and the Second World War started. In, in Europe, as Great Britain and France declared war on Germany. Actually, in, in Asia, the, the Second World War had already started two years previously when, when Japan invaded China. Now, Jeff, for the tribe, Jeff Heath and Johnny Broca, uh, during one game, had a fight in the dugout, which was staged. In other words, kind of a fake fight. They hoped that their manager, Oscar Vitt, would intervene, and if he did so, Heath would punch Vitt. Because he was this uh, very unpopular manager, but Vitt, Vitt did not intervene. On April 9th, another thing in, in, in American history, on Easter Sunday, Marian Anderson, the world-renowned opera singer, uh, performed, sang at an open-air concert in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. She had been barred from singing at Constitution Hall by the Daughters of the American Revolution. So this was, uh, you know, this was racism. She was an African-American. So this was really sort of, you would say we're headed toward uh, the civil rights movement, equal rights for African Americans. Now, there were, there were tremendous, movie, tre- tremendous movies in 1939. Gone with the Wind was one of them, you know. And another, The Wizard of Oz. And the, the third, The Grapes of Wrath. Home attendance for tribe games in 1939 was 563,926, down 90,000 or an average of 7,324 per game. The opening day in 1939 was at Cleveland Municipal Stadium, and Judy Garland, the star from The Wizard of Oz, sang the national anthem. So that was really something. Now, the coaching staff for the tribe, 1939, included Johnny Bassler, who was a tribe coach between 1938 and 1940. Johnny Bassler. Ski Malilo was a new coach. Malila was a tribe coach between 1939 and 1940, then in 1942, from 1945 to 1948, and in 1950. He was born in 1899 in Chicago, Illinois, and died in 1963 in Chicago at age 64. For his playing career, Malilo hit 260 with 22 home runs and 547 RBIs. He played for the St. Louis Browns Boston, and Boston Red Sox between 1926 and 1938. He was a manager for the St. Louis Browns in 1938 for nine games at the end of the season and had a record of 2-7. and seven. His given name was Oscar. They called him Ski. He won, he won a World Series title as a coach for the Tribe in 1948. He was also a coach for the Red Sox from 1952-53, to 53, the Kansas City Athletics from 1955-56. to 50, 56. They said he was called Ski. Another nickname was uh, Spinach. Uh, he, he had this, uh, this Malilo had the had a um, a life. He, his life was threatened by Bright's disease, an often fatal kidney inflammation. And the doctor's advice was a total spinach diet, and it worked. He was cured. Amazing. That's why people started calling him spinach. Malilo also had zoophobia, fear of animals, <coughs> including rabbits, birds, and snakes. And very often teammates would play uh, pranks on him. Based on that. In the minor leagues, he played for the Milwaukee Brewers and Winnipeg Maroons. Ski Malilo. Luke Sewell was another coach. He was a player coach. He was a catcher and a coach. And he was a tribe coach between 1939 and 1941. Uh, Sewell batted, batted 150. He had three hits, scored a run, had a double, an RBI, and walked in 16 games. And Sewell had been a player for the tribe between 1921 and 1932. So he was back again in 1939, playing again and coaching. Luke Sewell. Again, the manager for the tribe in 1939 was Ossie Vitt. He was tribe manager between 1938 and 1940. 
Bob Feller said this, quote, Resentment against Oscar Vitt was getting worse. Oscar knew baseball, but he didn't know human beings. Ossie Vitt. Now, the uh, starting lineup, lineup, Raleigh Hemsley was the catcher. Hemsley batted 263 with 104 hits. He scored 58 runs, had 17 doubles, 4 triples, 2 home runs, 36 RBIs, 2 stolen bases, 26 walks in 107 games. And Hemsley was with Cleveland from 1938 to 1941. Raleigh Hemsley. Hal Trasky was at first base. Trasky batted 335 with 150 hits. Scored 89 runs, had 31 doubles, 4 triples, 25 home runs, 104 RBIs, 2 stolen bases, 52 walks in 122 games. And Trotsky was with Cleveland from 1933 to 1941. He had severe headaches in 1931. His biographer, William H. Johnson, wrote, quote, There were times when his head would just throb. It was as, it was as if a fire hose had been t- turned on inside his skull, and the water had nowhere to go. The end of the season was a relief, and he yearned to get home, do some farming, and find some relief from the harsh crucible of the Cleveland press. He was voted the most popular Indian that year in a newspaper poll of the fans. A baseball memory he cherished his whole life. Hal Trotsky. Odell Bad News Hayes was at second base. Hale batted 312 with 79 hits. He scored 36 runs, had 16 doubles, 2 triples. Four home runs, 48 RBIs, four stolen bases, 25 walks in 108 games. And Hale was with Cleveland in 1931. And from 1933 to 1940, Odell, bad news Hale. Skeeter Webb was the shortstop. Webb batted 264 with 71 hits. He scored 28 runs, 14 doubles, a triple, two home runs, 26 RBIs, a stolen base, 15 walks in 81 games. And Webb was with Cleveland from 1938 to 1939. This was the end of his time in Cleveland. His MLB career continued until 1948. Skeeter Webb. Ken Keltner was at third base. Keltner batted 325 with 191 hits. He, had, he had 80, scored 84 runs, 35 doubles, 11 triples, 13 home runs, 97 RBIs, 6 stolen bases, 51 walks in 154 games. And Keltner was with Cleveland. From 1937 to 1944, and from 1946 to 1949, Ken Keltner. Jeff Heath was in left field. Heath batted 292 with 126 hits. He scored 64 runs, had 31 doubles, 7 triples, 14 home runs, 69 RBIs, 8 stolen bases, 41 walks in 121 games. And Heath was with Cleveland from 1936 to 1945. On August 27th, Heath was ejected from a game at League Park. He, he, he threw a bat. Yeah, he threw a bat after striking out. The next day, Heath popped out on a three-out O count in the ninth inning, and a drunken fan near the dugout yelled, "Why don't you throw your bat again?" Heath walked over and punched the man in the chest. However, the umpire and Oscar, manager Oscar Vitt did not see it, so there, he was not punished. Ted Williams. Uh, Ted Williams was a rookie in 1939, and he had in that same game he had a three-run home run uh, to def- help the Red Sox beat Cleveland six to five. Jeff Heath, Ben Chapman was in center field. Chapman batted 290 with 158 hits, he scored 101 runs, 31 doubles, nine triples, six home runs, 82 RBIs, 18 stolen bases, 87 walks in 149 games. Chapman was born in 1908 in Nashville, Tennessee, and died in 1993 in Hoover, Alabama, at age 84. For his career, he batted 302 with 90 home runs and 977 RBIs. He's also a manager, and he won 196 games as a manager, lost 276 for a winning percentage of 415. <coughs> Chapman played for the New York Yankees, Washington Senators, Boston Red Sox, Cleveland Indians, Chicago White Sox, Brooklyn Dodgers, and Philadelphia Phillies between 1930 and 1946. He was the manager of the Phillies from 1945 to 1948, four-time All-Star between 1933 and 1936. He won a World Series title in 1932 with the Yankees. He was a four-time American League stolen base base leader from 1931 to 1933. And in 1937, now he hurt his reputation in 1947 as manager of the Phillies, he shouted racist epithets at Brooklyn Dodger player Jackie Robinson. 
and this became an embarrassment for his team. Is he, on the Yankees, he played with Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Bill Dickey, and Joe DiMaggio. His 61, he had 61 stolen bases in 1931, the most in MLB between 1926, I mean 1921 and 1961. At Yankee Stadium, Chapman at one point uh, taunted Jewish fans with Nazi salutes and made disparaging epithets in 1947 with the Yankees. Chapman was uh, had a 3-0 count. Chapman told his uh, pitchers uh, if, if they had a 3-0 count on Jackie Robinson to hit him rather than walk him. So these are some troubling things. He was interviewed in the 1990s and said this quote, A man learns about things and mellows as he grows older. I think that maybe I've changed a bit. Maybe I went too far in the old days, but I always went along with the bench jockeying, which was, has always been a part of the game. Maybe I was rougher at it than some other players. I thought that you could use it to upset and weaken the other team. It might give you an advantage. The world changes. Now, you're, he was, now you reflected on the success of his son, who coached black players on an integrated team. Look, I'm real proud I raised my son different, and he gets along well with black players. That's a nice thing, don't you think? The minor leagues, Chapman played for the Asheville Tourists, St. Paul Saints, Richmond Colts, and Gadsden Chiefs. Ben Chapman. Bruce Campbell was in right field. Campbell betted 287 with 129 hits. He scored 84 runs, had 23 doubles, 13 triples, 8 home runs, 72 RBIs, 7 stolen bases, 67 walks in 130 games. And Campbell was with Cleveland from 1935 to 1939. (coughs) This was the end of his time in Cleveland. His MLB career continued until 1942. Bruce Campbell. Now, the bench players included Oscar Grimes, who was an infielder. Grimes batted 269 with 98 hits. He scored 51 runs, had 20 doubles, 5 triples, 4 home runs, 56 RBIs, 8 stolen bases, 56 walks, and 119 games. And Grimes was with Cleveland from 1938 to 1942. Oscar Grimes. Roy Weatherly. Played some outfield. Weatherly batted 310 with 100 hits. He scored 43 runs, had 16 doubles, 6 triples, a home run, 32 RBIs, 7 stolen bases, 19 walks in 95 games. And Weatherly was with Cleveland from 1936 to 1942. Roy Weatherly. Lou Boudreaux played some shortstop, was actually the starting shortstop the second half of the year. Boudreaux batted 258 with 58 hits. He scored 42 runs, had 15 doubles, 4 triples. 19 RBIs, 2 stolen bases, 28 walks in 53 games. Boudreaux Boudreaux was a player for the Tribe from 1938 to 1950 and and a manager for the Tribe between 1942 to 1950. So in other words, a player manager for the last 8 years. His father died of a brain tumor near the end of the season. And then he had one last visit with his father and Boudreaux said, quote, He told me how proud he was that he had that he had fulfilled the dreams he had for me when we played our special game of grounders in the schoolyard, and he'd tell me, Nice going, Lou. You broke another record. Lou Boudreaux. Frankie Pitelak was a spare catcher. Pitelak batted 268 with 49 hits. He scored 20 runs, had two doubles, five triples, 14 RBIs, four stolen bases, 20 walks in 63 games. And Pitelak was with Cleveland from 1932 to 1940. Frankie Pitelak. Ray Mack was this second baseman the second half of the year, or near the end of the year. Mack batted 152 with 17 hits. He scored 12 runs, four doubles, a triple, a home run, six RBIs, 12 walks in 36 games. And Mack was with Cleveland from 1938 to 1946. Ray Mack. Moose Salters played some outfield. Salters batted 275 with 28 hits. He scored 19 runs, had 7 doubles, 2 triples, 2 home runs, 19 RBIs, 2 stolen bases, 9 walks in 41 games. Salters was with Cleveland from 1937 to 1939, so this was the end of his time in Cleveland. His MLB career continued until 1943. Moose Salters. Jim Schilling played some second base. Schilling batted 276 with 27 hits. He scored eight runs, had seven doubles, two triples, 12 RBIs, a stolen base, seven walks in 31 games. 
Schilling was born in 1914 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and died in 1986 at age 72. His MLB he played his MLB career was with the Cleveland Indians and Philadelphia Phillies in 1939. And for his career, he batted 282 with 37 hits, 11 runs, 8 doubles, 5 triples, 16 RBIs, a stolen base, 8 walks in 42 games. Jim Schilling. Earl Averill was played some outfield. Averill batted 273 with 15 hits. He scored 8 runs, had 8 doubles, a home run, 7 RBIs, 6 walks in 24 games. Averill was with Cleveland from 1929 to 1939. This was the end of his time in Cleveland. He was traded. His MLB career continued until 1941. At the time, he was the Tribe all-time home run leader. Averill was traded on June 14th to Detroit for Harry Eisenstadt and Cat and Cash. He's in the Tribe Hall of Fame and the Baseball Hall of Fame. Averill died in 1983, and the Cleveland Plain Dealer editorial wrote this quote: "The death of Baseball Hall of Famer, Famer." Famer Earl Averill brings back boyhood memories of Old League Park and the athletes who were our heroes. Earl Averill. Lynn Larry played some shortstop. Larry batted twice. He struck out once in three games. And Larry played for, the Cle- played for Cleveland from 1937 to 1939, so this was the end of his time in Cleveland. His MLB career continued until 1940. Lynn Larry. Now, the pitching staff was... Anchored by the ace pitcher Bob Feller, who was 24 and nine, 24 and nine with an ERA of 2.85, 39 games, 35 starts, 24 complete games, four saves, four shutouts, a save, 296 and two thirds innings pitched, and 246 strikeouts. He led the league in vi- in victories, complete games, innings pitched, and strikeouts. Feller batted 212 with 21 hits. He scored 14 runs, had five doubles, a triple. Seven RBIs, 14 walks, and struck out 35 times. Feller was with Cleveland from 1936 to 1941, from 1946 to 1956, and was a tribe goodwill ambassador till the end of his life. In 1939, Feller was the most dominant pitcher in MLB. As I said, leading the league in quite a few categories. He was also on the All-Star team, which and the game was played at Yankee Stadium in New York City. Joe DiMaggio had a uh, home run. Bob Feller Feller pitched three and a third innings and got the save for the American League victory of three to one. Feller had two one hitters in 1939. On Mother's Day on May 14th, the Tribe and White Sox played in Chicago at Comiskey Park, and Feller's mother, father, and sister were all there. A foul ball hit Feller's mother in the face and knocked her unconscious. She was taken to the hospital, bruised but not seriously injured. The Tribe won that game 9-4. Kind of ironic, on Mother's Day. In 1939, Feller would have won the Cy Young Award, but the the award did not yet exist. Bob Feller. Al Al Milnar was 14-12 with an ERA of 3.79. 37 games, 26 starts, 12 complete games, 2 shutouts, 3 saves, 209 innings pitched, and 76 strikeouts. Milnar batted 253 with 20 hits. He scored 11 runs. Five doubles, six RBIs, five walks, 12 strikeouts, and 41 games. And Milnar was with Cleveland in 1936, from 1938 to 1943. Al Milnar. Mel Harder was 15-9, and nine, with an ERA of 3.50, 29 games, 26 starts, 12 complete games, a shutout, a save, 208 innings pitched, and 67 strikeouts. Harder batted 139 with 10 hits. He scored eight runs, had a triple, a home run. Nine RBIs, three walks, and struck out 17 times. Harder was a, a player for the Tribe from 1928 to 1947, and a Tribe coach from 1948 to 1963. Mel Harder. Johnny Allen was 9-7 and seven, with an ERA of 4.58, 28 games, 26 starts, 9 complete games, 2 shutouts, 175 innings pitched, and 79 strikeouts. <coughs> Allen batted 225 with 16 hits. He scored 10 runs, had two doubles, an RBI, three walks, 11, struck out 11 times in 34 games. Allen was with Cleveland from 1936 to 1940. Johnny Allen. Willis Hudlin was 9 and 10 with an ERA of 4.91. 27 games, 20 starts, 7 complete games, 3 saves, 143 innings pitched. 
Hudlin batted 188 with nine hits. He scored a run, had a double, a home run, four RBIs, walked three times, and struck out 16 times. And Hudlin was with Cleveland from 1926 to 1940. Willis Hudlin. Harry Eisen's stat was 6 and 7 with an ERA of 3.30, 26 games, 11 starts, <coughs> four complete games, a shutout, two saves. 103 and two thirds innings pitched and 38 strikeouts. Eisenstadt batted 250 with eight hits. He scored three runs, had a had an RBI, a walk, and struck out eight times. Eisenstadt was born in 1915 in Brooklyn, New York, and died in 2003 in Beechwood, Ohio, at age 87. For his career, he was 25 and 27 with an ERA of 3.89 and 157 strikeouts. Eisenstadt played for the Brooklyn Dodgers, Detroit Tigers, and Cleveland Indians between 1935 and 1942. He was Jewish. He went to James Madison High School in Brooklyn <coughs> and in 2008 was inducted into the Wall of Distinction there. During, in, during in, his last, in the last game of the 1938 season, Eisenstadt had pitched against Bob Feller in that famous game where the tri- Tigers and Tribe uh, were battling, Eisenstadt had a no-hitter into the eighth, and of course Feller had the record 18 strikeouts. Also in 1938, Eisenstadt was the pitcher, winning pitcher in both games of a doubleheader, and that during that doubleheader, Hank Greenberg hit three home runs. The Detroit, the Tigers manager Mickey Cochran warned Eisenstadt and Greenberg to stay in their rooms that night. Because, quote, the Jews in Detroit are going crazy. Of course, uh, Eisenstadt and, uh, and Greenberg were both Jewish, and they had done very, very well that day. He was traded to the tribe by the Tigers for Earl Averill. In the Second World War, he, he, he served in the U.S. Army, which ended his MLB career. After the war, he moved to Shaker Heights, Ohio, in the Cleveland area, and opened a hardware store. 1993, he was inducted into the Michigan Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. After his 2003 death, his papers were donated to the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland and are available to 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 serious scholars. In the minor leagues, he played for the Dayton Ducks, Harry Eisenstadt. Joe Dobson was a relief pitcher primarily. He was 2-3 with an ERA of 5.88, 35 games, 3 starts, a save, 78 innings pitched since 27 strikeouts. Dobson batted 056 with one hit and 18 at bats. He had a walk and struck out five times. Dobson was born in 1917 in Durant, Oklahoma, and died in Jacksonville, Florida in 1994 at age 77. For his career, he was 137 and 103 with an ERA of 3.62 and 992 strikeouts. Dobson pitched for the Cleveland Indians, Boston Red Sox, and Chicago White Sox between 1939 and 1954. He was an all-star in 1948 with the Boston Red Sox. He was an all-star in 1948 and is in the Boston Red Sox Hall of Fame. At age nine, he lost his thumb and left forefinger after playing with a dynamite cap, which apparently exploded. But he kept. But that didn't stop him from becoming a major league baseball player. In the Second World War, he was in the U.S. Army. In minor leagues, he played for the New Orleans Pelicans and Troy Trojans. And he was a Boston Red Sox coach in 1954. Joe Dobson. Johnny Broca was 4-2 and two with an ERA of 4.70. 22 games, 2 starts, 46 innings pitched, and 13 strikeouts. Broca batted 12 times, did not have a hit. He scored 2 runs, walked once, struck out 6 times. Broca was born in 1909 in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and died in 1985 in Lawrence at age 75. For his career, he was 44 and 29 with an ERA of 4.08 and 258 strikeouts. <clears throat> Broke a pitch for the New York Yankees and Cleveland Indians between 1934 and 1939. So this was the end of his MLB career. He won a World Series title in 1936 with the Yankees. In 1937, Broca took a leave of absence for, from the Yankees for no apparent for no apparent reason. And, and only pitched in seven games. He's Broca was of Lithuanian descent. He went to Yale University and played baseball and played, played on the baseball, boxing, and track teams. He was a pro boxer but had no victories. After he retired, he was a co- common laborer on road construction crews and died in 1985, 
not having spoken with his son for the past 25 years, who only lived 25 miles away. Johnny broke up. Bill Zuber was 2-0 with an ERA of 5.97. 16 games, one start, 31 and two-thirds innings pitched, and 16 strikeouts. Zuber batted 200 with one hit and five at-bats. He had a triple and struck out twice. Zuber pitched for Cleveland from 1936 to 1940. Bill Zuber. Johnny Humphreys was 2-4 with an ERA of 8.26. 15 games, a start, two saves, 28 and, and a third innings pitched, and 12 strikeouts. Humphreys batted seven times, did not have a hit, walked once, and struck out five times. And Humphreys was with Cleveland from 1938 to 1940. Johnny Humphreys. Tom Drake was 0-1 with an ERA of 9.00. Eight games, one start, 15 innings pitched, 15 innings pitched, 15 earned runs allowed, and one strikeout. He batted twice and did not have a hit. Drake was born in 1912 in Birmingham, Alabama and died in 1988 in Birmingham at age 75. For his career, he was 1-2 with an ERA of 6.13 and 13 strikeouts. Drake pitched for the Cleveland Indians in 1939 and the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1941. In minor leagues, he played for the Troy Trojans, New Orleans Pelicans, Milwaukee Brewers, Buffalo Bisons, Atlanta Crackers, Nashville Vols, Toronto Maple Leafs, Macon, Macon Peaches, Charleston Rebels, Lakeland Pilots, Fort Lauderdale Braves, Tampa Smokers, and West Palm Beach Indians. Tom Drake. Floyd Strom was 0-1 with an ERA of 4.85. Five games, 13 innings pitched, and four strikeouts. <clears throat> Strom batted 3.33 with one hit and three at-bats. He was born in 1916 in Cooperstown, North Dakota, and died in 1993 in Wenatchee, Washington at age 76. His MLB career was just with the Cleveland Indians in 1939. They called him Rock, and he played for the Northwestern Wildcats baseball team. Floyd Strom. Lefty Sullivan was 0-1 with an ERA of 4.26, 7 games, a start, 12 and, a two, 12 and 2 thirds innings pitched, and 4 strikeouts. Sullivan batted three times, did not have a hit, and struck out twice. He was born in 1916 in Nashville, Tennessee and died in 1988 in Scottsville, Arizona, at age 72. His MLB career was just with the Cleveland Indians in 1939. Lefty Sullivan. And finally, Mike Namick was 0-1 with an ERA of 1.93. Two games, a start, four and two-thirds innings pitched, and three strikeouts. He batted three times, did not have a hit, and struck out all three times. Namick was born in 1917 in Berlin, Pennsylvania, and died in 2005 in Stockton, California, his, his MLB career record was he was 5-7 and seven with an ERA of 3.93 and 64 strikeouts. Namick pitched for the Cleveland Indians and St. Louis Cardinals between 1939 and 1944. Mike Namick. Now after the regular season, the World Series was played. The American League champions, New York Yankees, swept 1-4 straight against the National League champions, Cincinnati Reds. And this was the Yankees' fourth straight title. Hall of Famers in the World Series for the umpires included Bill McGowan. For the Yankees, Joe McCarthy, the manager, Bill Dickey, Joe DiMaggio, Lefty Gomez, Joe Gordon, and Red Ruffing. For the Reds, Bill McKechnie, the manager, Ernie Lombardi, and, Lombardi, and Al Simmons. After the Game 4, when they clinched the series, the Yankees again sang the Beer Barrel Polka, the t- which was, became, had become the team anthem in the locker room. Lou Gehrig had not played after April 30th, but stayed with the team for the rest of the year and was released by the Yankees on October 16th because that, those were his wishes. He knew he couldn't play, any, play anymore. On July 4th, 1939, at Yankee Stadium, the Yankees had Lou Gehrig Appreciation Day between two, between two games of a doubleheader, and his number four was retired. This is the first time <coughs> in MLB history a team retired a number. And Gehrig spoke, quote, For the past two weeks, you have been reading about a bad break I got. Yet today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. When you have a father and a mother who work all their lives so you can have an education and build your body, that's a blessing. When you have a wife who has been a tower of strength and shown more courage than you dream existed, that's the finest I know. So I close in saying that I may have had a tough break, 
but I have an awful lot to live for. Thank you. Uh, sports writer Shirley Povich wrote, quote, I saw strong men weep this afternoon. Expression, expressionless umpires swallow hard. And emotions pump the hearts and glaze the eyes of 61,000 baseball fans in Yankee Stadium. Of course, the movie A Pride of the Yankees was made about Gehrig, Gehrig's life. Now, the MVP, MVPs for the MLB, for the American League, it was Joe DiMaggio of the New York Yankees. And for the National, League's, National League, Bucky Walters of the Cincinnati Reds. So that's the story of the 1939 Cleveland Indians. They had, a, they had a good year, a year to be proud of. God bless the fellows who played for the Cleveland Indians in 1939. And everyone, everyone else associated with the team, including the fans, especially Civil War veterans, Spanish-American War veterans, and First World War veterans. Captains of the Cuyahoga, lovers of Lake Erie, Terminal Tower Power, fans of the Free Stamp statue and the Fountain of Eternal Life, Euclid Avenue Electricity, Severance Hall Stalwarts, Cleveland Museum of Art Enthusiasts, Christmas Story House Happy People, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum uh, Rebels, First Energy Stadium Friends, Progressive Field Pals, Quicken Loans Arena Enthusiasts, Tribe, Browns, Cavs, Monsters, and Gladiators Rule, Cleveland, City of Champions. Cleveland is the best location in the nation on the north coast of America. New York is the Big Apple. Cleveland is a plum. Before you know it, it'll be opening day 2019. Go Tribe, this is our year. You may consider checking out our website at uh, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at PeterJRay.com. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.